Welcome to Friendly Words, the sermon podcast of Pratt Friends Church in Pratt, Kansas. The message you're about to hear was originally preached at Pratt Friends Church on Sunday, November 12th, 2023. It focuses on how to be discerning when dealing with people. The message to all who will listen is a person's heart is revealed in how they speak and act. Now, here is Pastor Mike Neifert. So let's pray and go to God's Word. Father, thank you that your Word is given to us to accomplish your purposes. And I pray, God, that as we go to Luke chapter 6 today, that you would, in fact, accomplish what you desire in each of our hearts. Help us to be attentive to what your Spirit's saying to us specifically. And God, I know I may not say out loud exactly what each person needs to hear, but you can say into their hearts and into their minds everything. And so I pray that you would reveal truth, that you would correct and rebuke and train in righteousness so that each man and each woman of God who's here today might be ready to do what you've given them. Amen. So a month or two or three ago, I bought a bag of gala apples from a Pratt area produce department. Normally, the apples from this store are of high quality. They're fresh and crisp. They're delicious. We've been buying apples from this establishment almost every week for 12 plus years, and we've had few problems, few complaints. The bag of beautiful red and gold apples that this story is focused on, not this apple, but anyway, something like this, uh, was not exactly like the hundreds of bags that we had purchased before. More than one of the apples in this particular bundle, were, when sliced open, were brown and gray on the inside. The ugly, mushy rottenness was hidden beneath this beautiful colored skin. After the third time this happened from the same bag, realizing that probably nearly half of the apples would be inedible, I took them back to the store for a new set of apples. The replacement fruit, happily granted by customer service, was as good as any that we've ever bought there. We've never had any problems since then. But... I have learned to be a little more careful when inspecting the apples. I actually look through the little clear part and make sure that there's no holes and stuff in the apples. I've checked them over just a little bit more carefully before I place them in my cart. I don't want obviously bad fruit because sometimes there's clues on the outside and I don't want to have to go through returning something I could have inspected better in the first place. So if you've read Luke chapter 6, you know that Jesus uses fruit and fruit trees to finish off his thoughts about loving enemies and not judging other people. You remember what he said about those things, right? Let me remind you by rereading a few verses, starting with verses 27 to 31. This is not our main passage. We're just reviewing now. So this is 27 to 31. Jesus is speaking. He says, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who mistreat you. If someone slaps you on one cheek, turn to them the other also. If someone takes your coat, do not withhold your shirt from them. Give to everyone who asks you. And if anyone takes what belongs to you, do not demand it back. Do to others as you would have them do to you. Pretty challenging, right? What Jesus commands goes against everything that our flesh desires. Rather than entertain thoughts of vengeance and violence, he encourages forbearance and forgiveness. He says, what you want done to you and, or for you, do those things for your neighbors. Do those good things for those who hate you. Do good to them even as they despise you. A few paragraphs later, after telling his listeners not to judge, he uses a comical illustration to make a point about the attitude that we're to have toward the shortcomings of others. 
His words are found in verses 41 and 42. He says, why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye, little, and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? That's a pretty silly image, isn't it? How can you say to your brother, brother, let me take that speck out of your eye when you yourself fail to see the plank in your own? You hypocrite, first take the plank out of your eye and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. (laughs) We have no right to condemningly judge anyone. When we see them falter, we're to look at ourselves and recognize our own failings. We first examine our motives and our attitudes and our actions. When we've dealt then, when we, then when we've dealt with our sins and our transgressions and our faults, then we'll be ready to help fellow strugglers. We'll be helpful rather than harsh, pointing them to God and encouraging holy living. Paul gives a similar gives similar directions to the church toward the end of Galatians. In the first verses of Galatians six. Paul shows how we, with God's help, can put into practice Jesus' words about specks and planks. He doesn't use specks and planks, but you can see the connection. Here's what he says, Galatians 6, 1 to 5. Brothers and sisters, if someone is caught in a sin, you who live by the Spirit should restore that person gently. But watch yourselves, or you also may be tempted. Carry each other's burdens, and in this way you will fulfill the law of Christ. If anyone thinks they are something when they are not, they deceive themselves. Each one should test their own actions. Then they can take pride in themselves alone without comparing themselves to someone else, for each one should carry their own load. So with God's help, his spirit convicting and directing our thoughts, we, can take, we, can, we take care of our sins without comparing our actions to anybody else's. And then with that same Spirit's guidance, we gently and humbly help our brothers, our sisters, our friends in the faith to overcome their sins and temptations. We're in this together. Anybody here never tempted? Yeah, a liar. There had to be a smart aleck that raised his hand, right? Anyway, (laughs) we need each other. And we're not to compare ourselves with each other because just because you sin differently than I sin doesn't mean that we're not in the same place. All right, that's enough review. So let's, uh, let's read the short paragraph, paragraph, which is Luke 6, 43 to 45, and see what exactly Jesus has to say as he continues speaking with his friends and us, we're listening in, along these same lines. He's continuing to say the same thing over and over. It's all about judging and comparing, and and so we're going to see that. So the setting and the audience in these verses are the same as they have been. You remember Jesus was up on the mountain. He chose the 12 who were going to be apostles, and then he came down from the mountain to the plain, and there was a large crowd of disciples there. He's speaking to them now. And he's talked about blessings on those who are part of the kingdom, who are, fo- who are God-focused, and he's pronounced woes on those who are not kingdom-minded. He's invited his followers, as we just noted, to love their enemies and warned them against judging too quickly those around them or judging others before you talk to yourself. And I imagine, though I don't know, that there might be a few fig trees nearby as he's speaking, and a vineyard maybe a short distance off, and perhaps Jesus notes people staring at the fruit. And their distracted gazes prompt this imagery that we're going to see now as he talks about good and bad fruit in Luke six forty three to 45, which I'm now finally ready to read. Listen to the Holy Spirit's voice as I read. Starting at verse 43, Jesus says, No good tree bears bad fruit. Nor does a bad tree bear good fruit. Each tree is recognized by its own fruit. People do not pick figs from thorn bushes or grapes from briars. A good man brings good things out of the good stored up in his heart, and an evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored up in his heart. For the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. I kid you not. I I caught someone from our church on the phone this week as they were taking a break from cutting down an apple tree in their yard. This brother's of yours who's here today, hello, 
uh, told me the tree was full of dead branches. It wasn't producing apples, so it was only a matter of time before it fell over and caused damage, so removing it was the only option. And you know, I felt kind of a strange sadness when I, when I heard this. While I understand why a bad tree needs to go, I, it somehow seemed tra- a tragic lo- loss because there's no more fresh fruit on a, to be plucked from the tree on a cool fall afternoon, no more crunchy goodness to share with a neighbor, no more apple pies from that tree. Now you feel the sadness, don't you? <laughs> Does Jesus feel the same sense of loss or tragedy when he looks at the hearts of those who, like bad fruit trees, are producing bad fruit in their lives? Is he sad as he watches the religious leaders of his day reject him and heap up heavy burdens on others and take advantage of the vulnerable? We know Jesus sometimes reacts angrily toward the Pharisees and the Sadducees, the teachers of the law, the elders, the chief priests, all those really uppity guys. We hear him rebuke them for their self-righteous thoughts, warn them to turn from their wicked ways, chide them for their hypocrisy. The parables he tells to them are very pointed and correct them. Behind all this, I think there's this aching heart Jesus knows the good that these leaders could do if only they would turn or if only they would repent along with the prostitutes and tax collectors and sinners. Jesus knows they could yield good fruit but recognizes they won't. They're bad trees with bad hearts producing bad fruit. Does that mean that there's no hope for them? Are they damned for eternity with no chance of salvation? The answer the Bible gives is an emphatic no. In the early days of the church, not long after the Spirit was given to the believers on the day of Pentecost, an interesting thing happened in Jerusalem. Acts 6 tells us how the church, following the leading of the Spirit, figured out how to take good care of widows, both Jewish and Gentile widows among them, without taking those with the gifts of teaching away from their main task. You'll find the story of how they appointed a group of men to make sure that every vulnerable woman got what she needed in the first six verses of Acts chapter 6. And then in verse 7, you find this. I'm going to read it for you. Acts 6 verse 7 says, I mean, this is after they've taken care of their widows well. They're loving each other. And so it says, so the word of the Lord, of God spread. So when we live in a loving way, God's word spreads. And then it says, the number of disciples in Jerusalem increased rapidly, and a large number of priests came, became obedient to the faith. Bad trees producing bad fruit can become good trees and produce good fruit when God does something. There's hope for all sinners who repent and become obedient. There's mercy for gossips and slanders and thieves and drunkards and self-righteous religious pretenders. Paul, the guy who penned most of the New Testament, a Pharisee. He was a Pharisee when Jesus got a hold of him. Turned, turned, he turned from his self-righteous, spiteful, and murderous ways and became a fruit bearer. He is a bad tree turned good, praise God. And I'm a bad tree turned good as well. Yes, amen. And I'm so glad that God's patient, not wanting any to perish, but all to have eternal life through Jesus. How about you? Is yours a story of transportation, transformation from bad tree to good tree? It's the only story there is. We are by nature bad trees. I know the popular culture says we're all good. (laughs) They have not turned on the news, or they're not paying attention to what they're telling us. We can only become good and produce good fruit if God intervenes in our lives and changes us. Listen to what Paul, the former Pharisee, says to the church in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 to 10. You're going to see good news and 
You're going to see the bad news and the good news together in his words as he goes through this. The bad news is about our heart's natural state. The good news is about what God can do in a man's heart and how he can change the way a woman thinks and and acts. And I think these words fit perfectly with Jesus's. You have heard me read this passage probably more than any other passage. I don't know. I've read it lots. But hear it again. Let the Spirit push it, press it, stick it in your heart. Here we go. As for you, that's all of us. He's writing the church. As for you, believers, you were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not from yourselves, it is the gift of God, not by works so that no one can boast, for we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works which God prepared in advance for us to do. Do you see it? We were all bad trees with bad hearts bearing bad fruit. We are, all of us who've put our faith in Jesus, now good trees with good hearts, that God has created goodness in us. We are all now good trees with good hearts which produce good fruit. It's really tempting to take a bite of this, but I won't. God has changed us so that we can now do his will, so that we can now do the good things that he created us to do even before we submitted to his good and gracious rule in our lives. We can do good to others even when they're spiteful toward us, to go back to what we've already read. Speaking of going back to what we've already read, it's time to read something new. No, it's not time to read something new. I'll get there. But let me go back and read verses 43 to 44. It'd be helpful if I actually read my notes. So 43 says, No good tree bears bad fruit, nor does a bad tree bear good fruit. Each tree is recognized by its own fruit. People do not pick figs from thorn bushes or grapes from briars. When I read the each tree is recognized by its own fruit part of Jesus' words in verse 44, I thought of this funny story from Susan's growing up years. As many of you know, she grew up in Burundi, Africa, and there was this lemon tree growing near an empty swimming pool in their backyard. And it was beautiful and green, but it didn't produce much of a lemon crop. It just, they weren't getting very many lemons from it. So sometime along the line, the Living Museum, it's kind of like a zoo-ish museum, anyway, this Living Museum in the capital city decided to remove a crocodile from their facility, like a live chomping crocodile, like hook, you know, tick tock, tick tock. Okay, crocodile. What? It wasn't big. This is my story now. Okay. (laughs) Anyway, I'm kidding. So this missionary teacher offered to take this crocodile Who volunteers for these things? But this missionary teacher volunteered to take it off of their hands and to care for the crocodile. And upon receiving it, the only place he could find to put it was in the pool by my wife's family's home. No water in the pool, okay? Just it's an empty pool. Not long after this reptilian pet was introduced to the enclosure, the lemon tree started producing prolifically. Evidently, Neighbors had been helping themselves to the fruit as they walked through the yard before this toothy newcomer showed up. And since they were now avoiding the area, more of the tree's bright yellow fruit was able to mature. I guess the saying is legit. When life gives you a crocodile, make lemonade. (laughs) 
I know, I know. Don't quit my day job, I know. Do any of you have fruit trees in your yard? Anybody? All right. And so, Scott, what kind of fruit trees do you have? Apricot. Apricot? How about you guys? Pear. Pear? Okay. So, uh, Scott, have you ever picked an orange from an apricot tree? Have you ever picked a citrusy fruit called an orange that is actually literally an orange from your apricot tree? And BJ, have you ever picked a pomegranate from your pear tree? No. They would be good, but you haven't done that. All right. That would be weird because... Apricot trees produce apricots, not oranges, and pear trees produce pears, not pomegranates. That was fun. What is true in the horticultural realm is, according to Jesus, true in the behavioral and in the spiritual realm as well. What's in a man's heart or a woman's heart will come out in actions. What's in their heart will show itself in words. Did you catch that at the end? It's talking about what comes out of our heart. Our words come from there. Our actions come from that. Jesus tells us this so that we can be discerning without comparing ourselves to others or becoming judgmental. There are people in this world who will not do the right thing. I should get a big amen from that, right? They might hurt you. They might harm you. Jesus knows this is coming. Persecution is coming. So pay attention to the fruit that you see in a person's life. What they regularly do will let you know what is likely to continue. Will you trust those who regularly do harm to the church? No. Will you love them the best way you can? Yes. All right, let me add a caveat concerning all that we've been talking about. I do not believe that Jesus is saying a person who loves him and has entered the kingdom of God will always do the right thing. You know, the good tree produces good fruit. Sometimes we get an odd, weird moment and we do the wrong thing, don't we? It's true for my life. Guessing it's true for you as well. There is this struggle between following our flesh and following or walking in step with the Holy Spirit who's within us as believers. Interestingly, when Paul talks about this in Galatians chapter 5, 16 to 25, fruit makes another appearance, the word fruit. So listen to what he writes. You'll hear lots about how the flesh and the spirit interact or conflict with one another and be urged to submit to the spirit. So hear God's word to you as I read Galatians 5, 16 to 25. So I say, this is Paul, so I say, walk by the Spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the Spirit and the Spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other so that you are not to do whatever you want. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. The acts of the flesh are obvious, sexual immorality, impurity, and debauchery, idolatry and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, and envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. What does bad fruit look like? It looks like all those things that Paul lists as the acts of the flesh and other things like them. It's not a complete list. If you watch someone's life and they're consistently doing these things or displaying these attitudes, their heart is most likely not set on God's ways, but on their own. They are likely not one of his children. Be sure you understand. 
I'm talking about consistently choosing these ways. I'm not talking about falling for temptation of the enemy from time to time, but an over and over again pattern with no sign of remorse, no intention to change, no desire to stop sinning. It's basically, God, I'm going to do what I want to do. Despite what your word says. So if you are chasing after sexual immorality, if you are chasing after impurity or debauchery, which is doing wicked things while you're drunk, if you are consistently, consistently being idolatrous, worshiping whatever, if you're engaged in witchcraft or being hateful or causing discord and all those other things, Paul, Paul says to you, you're not going to inherit the kingdom of God. Because kingdom of God people don't live consistently in this way. Those who will inherit the kingdom of God, who will be with Jesus forever, who will be resurrected and live in the new creation, are those who are full of the fruit of the Spirit. And it's consistently seen in their lives, even though sometimes they do dumb stuff. They are loving, and they are joy-filled, and Peace pursuing, they are patient or forbearing, they're kind and good and faithful, they're gentle, their answers are gentle, their answers are gentle, they're not harsh, their actions are under God's control, God creates self control within them. They are, to borrow Paul's phrase, in step with the Spirit. You can see these things in others, can't you? You can see them and without judging could discern what's in a neighbor's heart. With that knowledge, you can take godly action. You can love a neighbor even if he hates you. You can pray for a neighbor even if she's trapped in sin. You can gently correct a fellow believer who is temporarily out of step with the spirit. When I was in high school marching band way back in the day, we were we would be marching in a parade and the person on the end of the line, it, their job was to make sure everybody stayed in line. And they would just shout, guide right! And you're supposed to look to the right, make sure you're in line with the person. That's what we do. We just say, guide right! Look, are you in line with God's word? Are you in line with what God desires for you? With all of this in mind, Let's read the final words of Luke 6, starting at verse 46. I think you'll hear the theme of good fruit and bad fruit continue on. Pay attention to what Jesus is saying to you as I read. This is, again, Luke 6, 46 to 49. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I say? As for everyone who comes to me and hears my words and puts them into practice, I will show you what they are like. They are like a man building a house who dug down deep and laid the foundation on rock. When a flood came, the torrent struck that house but could not shake it because it was well built. But the one who hears my words and does not put them into practice is like a man who built a house on the ground without a foundation. The moment the torrent struck that house, it collapsed and its destruction was complete. The question in verse 46 is, is a good one. If you say Jesus is Lord, your actions will either confirm the truth of your words or expose them as a lie. You are only a subject of the one you call Lord if, in fact, you do what your Lord says. Right? If you ignore your, support, if you ignore your supposed Lord, he is not your Lord. Jesus says doing what he says is the only sure foundation for life. Hearing his words and not doing what he says only leads to destruction. And you can see destruction in the lives of others and in your own life when you do the wrong thing. Destruction of peace of mind, destruction of true happiness, destruction of relationships, destruction of body and mind. Doesn't it break your heart when you see the dire consequences of your son's sinful decisions or your granddaughter's godless actions or your friend's obsession with things which take them away from God? 
hope it breaks your heart when you are convicted of your own as well, but let the heart break about what's going on in other people's lives drive you to your knees in prayer for them. We ought to be praying things like, God, free my buddy from drunkenness. Rescue my cousin from hatred and bitterness. Bring freedom from rage to my neighbor. Let my single friends find satisfaction in you rather than in immorality. Release my sister-in-law from the clutches of new age spirituality or whatever it is. All these things are spoken to God with no malice in our hearts toward those for whom we pray. We love them. That's why we pray for them. We pray for friends and enemies alike with God's unconditional love, fully engaged. We pray for them in our hearts and in our private places, and then we go and love them in practical ways whenever and wherever God grants us the opportunity. Friends, live your life in step with the Spirit. Do what Jesus says. Let God's good fruit be seen in your actions. Be discerning when dealing with others. Deal with your sins and help others to do the same. This is the good fruit that comes from a good tree because the good heart's been changed by Jesus. We can only do this by the help of the Spirit. He is with us and he's in us and he's for us. I'm going to read all of what we've covered today one more time and then allow some space for conversation with God. Pay attention to what God may be saying saying to you as you listen. So this is Luke 6, 43 to 49. I'm going to pray when we get done and then we'll take some time in silence to allow God to speak to us, to allow us the opportunity to respond to him. Jesus is speaking No good tree bears bad fruit, nor does a bad tree bear good fruit. Each tree is recognized by its own fruit. People do not pick figs from thorn bushes or grapes from briars. A good man brings good out of the good stored up in his heart, and an evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored up in his heart. For the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I say? As for everyone who comes to me and hears my words and puts them into practice, I will show you what they are like. They are like a man building a house who dug down deep and laid the foundation on rock. When a flood came, the torrent struck that house but could not shake it because it was well built. But the one who hears my words and does not put them into practice is like a man who built a house on the ground without a foundation. The moment the torrent struck that house, it collapsed and its destruction was complete. God, help us to hear your voice. God, correct us in whatever ways you need to. Help us to be discerning as we deal with people and to be loving even toward our enemies. God, you've got a lot of work to do in all of us because we tend to go back to our flesh when we're tired or weak or angry. God, help us. Help us to be your people. Show us what we need to do with your word and help us to put it into practice as we go from this place. God, I pray that you would bless each person as they respond to your word today. In Jesus' name, amen. We hope you have been encouraged and challenged by today's sermon. If you want to hear each week's message, be sure to subscribe to Friendly Words in your podcast app. May God bless you as you follow Jesus in the power of the Holy Spirit.